All right, hello everybody. Today we are going to start a series called The Theory of Everything, Ontological Mathematics and the Theory of Everything. We are going to explain where existence comes from, why it exists in the first place, and we're going to get into how to explain existence from an idealist perspective rather than from a materialist perspective. We're going to get into the philosophy of materialism versus idealism. We're going to learn where materialism fails and falls and what questions materialism can't answer, and we're going to show you uh, what the answers are in terms of mathematical idealism, which has been solved by a philosopher named Mike Hockney in his series of books, which are called the God series, series of books. You can find them on Amazon under uh, his author name, Mike Hockney. Uh, of course, in my own books, I've uh, recounted just a slight little bit of those uh, of, of the philosophy of ontological mathematics, as I've had to touch on it in order to explain, in order to explain some of my own findings and some of the things that I've been doing with my uh, with my work exposing the fraud of, of I mean, they, it meshes in perfectly together actually ontological mathematics in the way that I have exposed the fraud of scientific peer review in the in the modern scientific system. It's really quite wonderful. Uh, so anyway, let's get into this. Part one is ontological mathematics and the theory of everything. Part one, why does something exist rather than nothing? What an awesome question, isn't it? Yes, it is an awesome, fun question. There we go. Let me place this in a good spot. Yeah, that works. Okay, so the first thing that we need to face is what's called epistemic justification. And so epistemic justification means how do you know that you know? How do you know that you know anything? And so, how do we come by knowledge? How can you actually establish that you're not just talking about feelings or personal perspective and something that can just be dismissed? How do you know that you know? How do you know anything? Whence, by whence do we come by knowledge? Yes, so Leibniz answered this question, although it was formulated by, of course, who else would you expect? The ancient Greeks, the classical Greeks, uh, Maybe it was the ones just before the classical Greeks. Anyway, yeah, that time period, right? The great philosophers, I should have referenced him. Anyway, but Leibniz was the one who really uh, codified it uh, in this expression called the principle of sufficient reason. So for every item of knowledge, there must be a sufficient rational reason, of course, not just a feeling, but a rational reason, a logical reason uh, for why it is so and not otherwise. Why is it this way and not other, not another way? You must be able to explain that. Yes, Leibniz. No fact can be genuine or existent, and no proposition true, unless there is a sufficient reason for why it should be so, and not otherwise. You must be able to explain it. Once you have sufficiently explained everything, and you uh, you can eventually get to a point where you know that you know something, because there is really no other possibilities. It's possible to get there. Well, for example, mathematics. 1 plus 1 equals 2. How do you know that? What is the sufficient reason for 1 plus 1 equals 2? The sufficient reason for 1 plus 1 equals 2 is that... 2 is equal to, is just a different way of writing 1 plus 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2 is no more than saying 1 plus 1 equals 1 plus 1. You're simply rewriting 1 plus 1 as a simpler uh, expression, as a simpler symbol, yes? And so uh, that's the sort of reason that you can actually reduce existence to, uh, surprisingly, believe it or not, and we will get there. Okay, we either use reason to know things or we know nothing at all, of course, yes? Uh, we could use emotions. However, emotions conflict, don't they? We all have different emotions, different goals, right? Uh, the senses, well, the senses conflict. Uh, you know, you know the, I'm sure that you are aware, intelligent as you are, of the idea of uh, eyewitness testimony and how unreliable eyewitness testimony is actually is. You can remember things that you think you saw that you didn't see at all. And, and, and in other examples, there can be things in your visual field of awareness which you simply do not register whatsoever. You know that famous example of the, of the man in a bear suit who walks through a basketball game uh, while you are busy counting the number of passes and you don't even see this bear. So anyway, uh, the senses are not a reliable uh, measure of what exists and, and reason. Uh, mystical experiences are, of course, you know, there is some legitimacy, I mean, legitimacy, of course, in my recent book and in some of my books I've talked about different types of mystical experiences and whether they're valid or not. And uh, some are valid, but still it's quite inconsistent material, uh, subject matter. Uh, yeah, so anyway, these are all per personal and they conflict, uh, whereas the best and pure reason applies universally. So, for example, going back to 1 plus 1 equals 2, which is simply saying 1 plus 1 equals 1 plus 1. It's a tautology. Tautology is true by defini definition. 
And there's really no need to question it. There's no ability, possibility of questioning it. Yes? Okay, so that's how we know. So now that we established how can we know things, uh, let's continue. So let's continue with what exists. The answer, first of all, to what exists, you know, if you ask different people, you get different answers, right? So it depends generally on personality type, what kind of question or answer people are willing to accept, right? Uh, but this is not to say that the question is not, uh, it, it's not possible to answer that question uh, rationally and logically. It is, yes. Was, uh, but if we take the emotional type, for example, uh, you get the, the, the basic statement, you know, existence is love, right? But of course, as a rationalist, uh, you say, well, what is love? How do you define it? Uh, what are its properties? Uh, how can you manipulate or engineer it? Where does it come from in the first place? Why should it exist? What created love? And do we all love the same things? What about hate? Because, you know, love often turns into hate, right? So, of course, these are just juvenile. Juvenile, basically feminine sort of answers. Uh, love is it's totally meaningless and deceptive. Uh, you know, often quite deceptive, right? <laughs> these people who, are these, the people who go in for love are typically the most hateful people you will actually ever find and deceptive people. Uh, so mystical types, uh, existence is a great mystery. Well, why would it be unknowable? Why would the existence that we partake of and exist in, why would we be unable to know what we are made of? We are made of existence, are we not? Like, why would there be some sort of dualism where we are made of existence, but we are not able to understand the existence we are made of? How strange would that be, right? Uh, it sort of sets up a sort of a, a dualism, like a Cartesian dualism, it's called, you know, a dualism between we're us and then there's existence and we're totally separate and can't understand each other. You know, it's like, well, how could the same substance not understand itself? We're all the substance of existence. We are existence. We partake of existence. We are here in existence, existing in some form or another. It'd be very strange. Why would it? Why would existence be such a mystery that we can't? Who would set that up? How would you set that up? Anyway, and obviously we do know things. We have science, and we're we're sending rockets to the moon, and so we're able to know some things of existence. We're able to understand and know some things in existence. So, uh, what? Where's the dividing line? Like, where's the arbitrary dividing line? And who sets that arbitrary dividing line between where it goes from? Oh, this is stuff we can know and engineer and understand, uh, oh, but here's the line, and that's where we can't know things anymore. Like, how do you establish that? And well, I mean, obviously, people have spent a, a great deal of time on that question. Uh, Kant being uh, one of the most famous examples, uh, you know, he really tried to outline the case for uh, for there being a, a, a part of reality that we can never know. And of course, he was only doing that because he was just, uh, you know, he had that predetermined uh, predetermined idea which he simply created his philosophy to try to work towards because he was ultimately a person of faith and so he wanted to leave room for faith right so i mean his whole philosophy is such a joke i can't believe people spend so much time writing about it it's ridiculous um where is the line but yes between knowing things and the unknowable how can the unknown create the known uh, is the unknown same for all okay so i mean it just reduces to you know things you can't understand oh well people love that people love not being able to understand because if you uh, if you can convince everybody that it's not possible to understand, then any old BS you make up is plausible, right? And that's really what these people want. They want to be able to create their own uh, plausible BS and then uh, be believed for it. Ugh. Okay, sensing type. This is the, this is really the worst type. This is even worse. Uh, existence is the senses. So these are Plato's prisoners, right? These are the pl the prisoners in Plato's cave, looking at the shadows on the wall, thinking that this is all that existence is, uh, touching things with their hands, seeing things with their eyes, and they think that this is what existence is. And now in quantum mechanics, they think that's what creates existence. Looking at things, looking at something is what creates existence. <laughs> it's just the stupidest. It's the dumbest thing you could possibly imagine. I look at something and looking at it is what makes it real. Turns it from an abstract probability wave function that doesn't exist to something that does exist. So how, how do my eyes do that? I mean, how do your eyes do that? Ridiculous. Okay, so yeah, so for example, ask the materialist. Ask the scientific materialist, which is all scientists today, ask them what a fundamental particle is, right? So uh, eventually you'll get them to say, well, it seems to be some form of energy. Well, so then ask them what energy is. They don't know what energy is. They have no definition for energy whatsoever. They just take it as a, as a given. They have no definition for energy whatsoever. They just take it as a magical given. It's basically their God. It just exists. And they don't have to explain what it is or why it exists or where it comes from and what its meaning is and why it works the way that it does or anything. It's just a magical existence, right? They will never address that question. They avoid that question like the plague. It's all very strange. Um, of course, do we all sense the same things? No, we do not all sense the same things. 
at all. So rationalists, reason is what exists. The principle of sufficient reason is what exists. At its basis, existence must be rational. If existence wasn't rational, if it wasn't logical, it's either rational, which means logical or illogical. So if it was illogical, existence could be anything at any time. This laptop and this table I'm sitting on could just poof randomly out of into non-existence. So that they don't do that means that existence is fundamentally rational because if it was irrational, no existence would be here at any time. It would be in a constant state of flux changing between all sorts of different forms and never consistent, right? Uh, anything could happen at any time. And so uh, reason, and especially mathematical reason again, of course, I should have this quote from Galileo where he says, uh, you know, how do we understand nature? We understand nature through its own language, which is the actual, actually the language of circles and triangles and geometry. And, you know, he goes on to make the point that it's mathematics. That's how we understand nature. How interesting. Why would mathematics explain nature if nature had nothing to do with mathematics? Yes. Okay. So we're still getting to this question. Why something rather than nothing? Why does something exist rather than nothing? I mean, there's a, a YouTube channel out there called Closer to Truth. And this fellow who might be an analog in, in some way of Mike Hockney, in fact, because he asks all the right questions, but he never gets to the right answers. It's so funny because he only ever talks to materialists, of course. And of course, who out there is an ontological mathematical idealist besides me and maybe five other people in the world? Not many people, right? Um, in any case, yes, this fellow on this channel is uh, really disturbed by the question, why should something exist rather than nothing? And uh, well, here, we can answer him now, actually, and we can answer all scientists. Well, if you think about it, uh, nothing really should exist, first of all, right? Because nothing is required to create nothing. So think of that, right? So nothing really should be the base state. Nothing requires no effort to create it. It's default because, uh, you know, if you think about it, this would solve the problem. I mean, if this was legitimate, I'm not saying it is yet, but if it was legitimate, then this would solve the problem of needing to appeal to something outside of something to create something, right? Because we have this existence, right? And we say, well, what created it? Well, God created it. Okay, well, God is something that seems to be outside of existence that creates existence. Well, then we just ask the question, well, what created God then? Oh, well, that's just permanent. Well, what is God? Where did God come from? Why does God exist permanently? What are its properties? What are his properties? It's an it or hit or what? Uh, and, and it or his or, or what have you. Yes, yeah? so what are God's properties? Why does God always exist? And uh, you know, so on. It's just, uh, you know, it's an infinite kind of regress uh, problem and doesn't actually uh, explain what we want. Why does God exist rather than no God would be the next question, right? And so what's the answer to that? Well, it's the same thing. You hit a brick wall. There is no answer. So, um, so you really need uh, something that is self-contained and explains itself. So in effect, we, uh, we need to explain God if you want to think it in think of it in terms of God, the traditional religious perspective, but we're going to go uh, somewhat beyond that, in fact. Um, but the thing about nothing is that nothing requires nothing to exist and hence uh, would be self-consistent and self-contained because it would appeal to nothing outside of itself to exist. So wouldn't that be great? Because uh, if you don't have to appeal to something outside of yourself to exist, that means that you're self-existent, right? You don't need, right? It, it halts that regress of always trying to look for something else uh, to create the thing that you just said existed, right? So nothing has the property that it's self-existent and self-contained because it appeals to no outside force to create it. No force is required to create nothing. It's nothing, right? Well, that would be very, very neat, wouldn't it? I mean, if we could use that in some way. Aren't we trying to explain something? We're not trying to explain nothing. We're trying to explain something. The something being this universe, uh, something being anything at all, right? Anything at all. So, ah, here we go. I'm giving it away. Something is nothing. Oh my gosh, how can that be? How can something be nothing? How can this be? Doesn't this seem like a totally contradictory statement? Uh-oh, I've ran into Godelian incompleteness, haven't I? Right, as I discussed in my uh, most recent book, Planet Wars. Uh, well, let's see here. <clears throat> Principle of sufficient reason. If nothing is self-existent, now here's the key, the first step, okay? This is the first step to understanding why, some, why something exists rather than nothing, okay? Why a universe exists rather than nothing, why any existence exists at all, yes? <clears throat> so if nothing is self-existent, then any type of nothing will exist, right? That's a principle of sufficient reason. 
If nothing is self-existent because it appeals to nothing outside of itself to exist, then any type of nothing can exist because it's nothing. It required nothing to exist and it basically doesn't really exist either, right? In a sense. So nothing would be the base state. It requires no effort to create it. It's default. Nothing requires no effort to create it. Nothing is the base state and it's default. Because where would effort come from? Because if you want to posit existence is created by some sort of effort from some being, where would that effort come from? Well, then you have to say, oh, well, existence was created by God. Well, then you say, of course, what created God? Well, God is self-existent. But why? But why? That's what we're going to answer, actually, right? Where would effort come from? We cannot impose or presume any effort because we're not going to simply stop at the answer of, well, God did it, because we, in fact, are going to explain that, right? So where would effort come from? It has Existence has to be self-existent because you cannot appeal to effort outside of existence to create existence. Existence has to be self-contained, yes? Existence itself, not just this universe, the whole concept of existing at all, existence, okay? All right, here's the key. Here's the next key. There are two types of nothing. One, absolute static nothing. So this is how we normally think of nothing. So it has no manifestation, has no phenomena, and it's true nothing. It has no manifestations, no properties, no internal properties. Nothing is going on. This is true nothing. So this is the true nothing you would think of that's totally blank, black, and you know, pure nothingness with no phenomena, no manifestation. Yes? Here we get to the trick. Yes? Two net resultant motion, net resultant nothing from motion. So resultant nothing from motion has internal properties, internal manifestation and phenomena, but they add up to nothing. Okay. So net resultant motion from nothing. It has internal properties because it's based on motion, but they add up to nothing. It has internal manifestation and internal properties. It's a nothing with internal properties which all add up to nothing, okay? So the principle of sufficient reason, remember? If nothing is self-existent because it requires nothing outside of itself to exist and no effort from outside of itself to exist, then any type of nothing must exist. So there is nothing to prevent any type of nothing from existing because what would you appeal to outside of nothing to stop nothing from existing, right? That's not possible. You can't do that without running into infinite regress, yes? So the principle of sufficient reason, if nothing is self-existent because it requires nothing outside of itself to exist and no effort to exist, then any type of nothing must exist. Any type of nothing will exist. Yes. So net resultant, net resultant nothing from motion is the existence we are actually interested in because this has internal properties, internal manifestation and phenomena, but which add up to nothing. Okay. So net nothing, the principle of sufficient reason again. A nothing which with internal parts, which net to nothing, must contain, we're going to start describing net nothing here, okay, must contain the simplest possible parts because there is no sufficient reason for anything arbitrarily more complex than the most simple possible parts. Because you would ask, how much more arbitrarily complex than the most simple should net nothing be? So a net nothing of motion based on motion, but which add up this motion, which adds up to nothing, right? How complex should this motion be? Well, it should be the simplest possible because that's the only logical possible solution. Because why would it be arbitrarily more complex than the most simple? Who would set that limit? Who would set that limit of this is the level of complexity where existence is going to start, where net nothing is going to start existing, right? So it has to be the simplest possible. So this goes to the principle of parsimony, which is like uh, the rule of Occam's razor, the simplest possible solution. And of, uh, of course, uh, why wouldn't existence be uh, the, the simplest logically possible? It would, why would you expect it to be? There's no sufficient reason. There's no sufficient reason. There's no principle of sufficient reason you can come up with to say that there's an arbitrary standard at which uh, there's a complexity level at which existence begins. Existence has to begin, a net nothing existence has to begin at, the, begin at the simplest, or be based on rather, the simplest 
possible structure, not an arbitrarily more complex structure, because you could never define what that would be. There'd be no justification for it under the principle of sufficient reason. But there is principle of sufficient reason for saying that is the most possible, most simple possible. Yes. Because that's the only one that is logical. All right. So, and with that, we have existence. We have just justified existence with sufficient reason that something can exist, which is self-contained and halts the infinite regress of appealing to something outside of itself to perform effort to create it. Existence has to exist effortlessly. And something is justified because something under special circumstances reduces to nothing and nothing requires no effort to exist and is the default state. It is self-existent. So that something is, of course, net nothing and net nothing, but with internal properties based on motion. So it's a net nothing and whatever this motion is doing. We're going to explain this, don't worry, in the next slide or in the next uh, part, actually. Uh, so this net nothing uh, produces, uh, has internal motion, right, which produces our existence. Okay. All right. So nothing has existed. So this is another property of nothing. Nothing has existed, uh, has existed eternally. Existence as something as net nothing has existed eternally and is indestructible. It has simply always existed because nothing need not ever have been created. So it's always existed. Yes. So just as there is no requirement of anything outside of nothing to perform effort to create it, nothing, there's nothing outside of nothing to perform effort to destroy it. Yeah. So there's nothing outside of nothing to destroy net nothing. Right. So that means that it's always permanently existed. Existence is permanent. Now, just to be clear here, existence is not synonymous with what we uh, detect here with our senses in this universe. Right. Uh, you know, generally, we would think of this universe as having had a big bang 13, what is it, 0.7 billion years ago, yeah? And so uh, this universe certainly is not permanent. It seems to have had an origin, okay? So I'm talking about existence itself. So existence is permanent. This universe uh, is temporary relative to existence. Uh, maybe we'll get more into that in a later slide. Okay, so existence is justified, later part, existence is justified via the principle of sufficient reason, so rejoice. So this fellow, all these people and philosophers who are so worried about why existence exists uh, rather than nothing, why something exists rather than nothing, we have now answered it. Uh, we are going to then go on though and explain further in part two what exactly is net nothing? Because now I need to explain what this actually is, what it looks like, what are its properties? And yes, we have those answers. What are its properties? What is it made of? What are these internal properties of net nothing? What is the simplest possible form of a net nothing uh, based on motion instead of a static net, static nothing, which is just nothing, a net nothing based on motion? Well, what is that motion? What does it look like? What are its properties? How do we explain it? And we can do so. And we will do so now in part two which will be the theory of everything, part two, what is net nothing. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and again, this is the most brief summary that I can try to produce for relatively short, uh, looks like 25 minutes, uh, 25 minute videos. Uh, all of this is based on a series of books, which number into the uh, 32 books, I think, just in the God series of um, uh, volumes alone. 32 books uh, covering some several million words. I forget how many words precisely it is, uh, but it's quite a few in the, up in the millions, several of millions. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, my best attempt at uh, distilling it into something quick. Now, of course, it took uh, millions of words of reading all this and studying over years to be able to understand it that, uh, to this level and be convinced of the principle of sufficient reason uh, applied to all these concepts. And so, yeah, sure, you might have questions. How did you come to that conclusion so so quickly? Oh, it wasn't quick. It took many years. Uh, but if you have questions, obviously, yeah, put them in and uh, in the comment section, and I will uh, attempt to address them. And as we go on, we will get into a little bit more detail here. Yeah, so part two will be coming up. What is next? Nothing. Uh, just by the way, I have six parts already ready to go, so you can look forward to that. Uh, maybe I'll try to do uh, release them. Uh, once every uh, week or two or something like that uh, when I get free time. Okay, let's see. I hope you enjoyed that. I did. I really like this stuff. It's so much fun. And uh, wow, it's really going to get fun in the future with the next parts. Okay, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye.